you. Okay. So, welcome everyone to our uh, monthly seminar on research on spirituality and health. And uh, we have today an amazing speaker, Dr. Stephen Post, who is a professor, uh, many years a professor at Case Western, and now at uh, in New York at the State University there. And he has written many, many books. He's um, He's been a close friend of mine for, we were just talking about that for almost 30 years. And he directs the Unlimited Love Institute at his university that uh, John Templeton actually started. And he does lots and lots of bioethics work, but today he's gonna talk about his book. Um, and <laughs> Dr. Post, why don't you, uh, why don't you take over and uh, share your screen and begin um, this lecture, which I think will um, thrill everyone. Okay, thank you, Harold. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, Harold and I have been friends for a long, long time and we've had such a joyful back and forth, full of mirth and it's kept us young. Uh, going way, way back to Sir John Templeton uh, in the 19, early 1990s. Um, so I actually uh, 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 direct the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook, the Institute uh, for Research on Unlimited Love, so named by Sir John, is uh, a separate entity. Uh, that is uh, still uh, Cleveland-based, actually. Um, wow. But for about uh, really now going on 35 years, I've been extremely interested in uh, the whole field of what this book refers to as deeply forgetful uh, people. Uh, that's a, an expression that I actually uh, first uh, discussed with a wonderful philosopher uh, at the uh, at Michigan State uh, University. Uh, and so it's not entirely original, but uh, I wanted to make use of it because I think it makes it makes such a difference and is such a preference over the word dementia. So when I was in Chicago uh, as a grad school student years and years ago, um, I had the opportunity to interact with Sir John Eccles, who had won the Nobel Prize um, for his work on the physiology of uh, neurotransmission. And um, Sir John uh, is quoted here, I maintain that the human mystery is incredibly demeaned by scientific reductionism with its claim in promissory materialism to account eventually for all of the spiritual world in terms of patterns of neuronal activity. This belief must be classed as a superstition. We have to recognize that we are spiritual beings with souls existing in a spiritual world, as well as material beings with bodies and brains existing in a material world. Well, be that uh, as it may, and you may or, not, may or may not be interested in such a perspective, but it's there and it represents a, a view that is very prominent in most cultures around the world. Um, so I'm not trying to prove anything, but I just want to bring it to your attention. And this got, is- Stephen, John yeah. Eccles, he won the Nobel Prize. Is that correct? Yes, he won the Nobel Prize. Yes, what, he did. What was it in? What did he win it in? It, it, it was in uh, medicine for uh, physiology. Okay. Yes. He basically uh, you know, is the one who discovered the whole synaptic system and it's- uh, and, and the trans, uh, the, the uh, communication going on between uh, various neurons. He was a brilliant guy. Um, and so uh, very influential on me. This is a picture uh, by Chagall. I think many of you will recognize uh, these uh, Chagall windows. Um, Chagall was a person who was also like Eccles, uh, not a material, certainly 
uh, was a mystic in essence. Uh, uh, he claimed that blue was the color of love, and he used symbols from all of the various spiritual traditions of the world to try to capture uh, what he thought was the ultimate reality, which he felt was the, uh, the energy of love in the, uh, in the universe and underlying the universe. So in 1995, just to, to point this out, um, I was at Bangalore, which is a beautiful place in India, and I'd been invited to uh, convene and uh, do a plenary at a conference by the uh, national, by the Indian National Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, it was really a wonderful conference, and I gave my talk on why I felt that Western philosophy was morally um, unacceptable in the sense that we put too much emphasis on linear rationality as a reason why a human being should be morally considered under the protective umbrella of do no harm or beneficence and the like. And I said that uh, to me, linear rationality is not so important. What's really important is consciousness and deeply forgetful individuals uh, have consciousness. They can enjoy the fall leaves. They can enjoy the smell of an apple pie. They have creativity galore in some cases. So um, I, um, I didn't think that linear rationality was so important. And then in walked a really interesting man who sat in the back of the room and uh, nobody really noticed the, him. The, the, the place was filled with Hindu neurologists and Hindu philosophers. And it turned out to be his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And he put his hand down on the desk and he said, you know, there's no reason to respect somebody more as a human being because their memory or their rationality is intact. It's their consciousness that counts. And that is pretty much uh, the, the Hindu perspective on this. But there are mind-body philosophers who really don't necessarily accept the materialist view of, uh, of the mind. Uh, Thomas Nagel, uh, uh, long of Princeton and then of NYU, uh, just doesn't think that mind is derivative from matter, although of course I recognize that there are about 11 competing theories of how it is. None of them have, have been actually uh, demonstrated, but, but still, uh, you know, it's, there, there are different views on this, but Nagel is an interesting one who is not entirely contrarian because quite a few philosophers would accept what he, what he argues. Um, what does dignity mean? Uh, to me, uh, well, it's the quality of being worthy of honor and respect, uh, and hence dignity for deeply forgetful people. Uh, from a more spiritual perspective, it seems to me to be something like this, to hold a person in grace. Um, I was with Joe Foley. Fo uh, the book is dedicated to Joe Foley. What's that? Okay. A neurologist uh, who was at Case Western for many, many years. He'd been at Harvard before then. And he was my mentor. Um, we went to a geriatric psychiatric hospital in Mount Vernon, Ohio, in the middle of Ohio, of all places. And there was a special wing of the hospital devoted to people with Down syndrome who had now gotten into their 50s and even more. And most of them uh, had uh, uh, evidence of probable Alzheimer's disease. So they were seeing a kind of development in reverse. But there was this community of Hindu uh, nurses, nurses aides, and several neurologists who lived in Mount Vernon. And they took care of these individuals with such kindness and such warmth. And their facial expressions were always so graceful. Uh, they were never... Uh, uh, reacting to any of the behaviors around them. They were very much centered on kindness. And so Joe and I um, took a couple of these individuals out to a pizza restaurant in, uh, in Gambier, Ohio. And we asked them, so what is it that makes you so devoted to what you're doing? You're out here in the middle of Ohio. There aren't too many uh, Hindus who living, living around here, but here you are. What, what floats your boat? And they said, namaste. And of course, you know, that means uh, I honor the divine in you as you honor the divine in me. Uh, most spiritual traditions have some ethic that's based on that sort of a concept. Uh, Larry um, Dossi would refer to this as the one mind, but so would a great many physicists uh, 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 that somehow our minds are a gift uh, 
uh, they're part of some larger consciousness that we don't understand that remains a mystery. Uh, contrary to uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, who was asked uh, something about the basis of human dignity, he said it's very hard to assert human dignity when we were really nothing more than quote glorified pond scum. Uh, he didn't mean that in a derogatory sense, but he just said that, you know, ultimately we have to think about what we, what we lose when Thank we- Thank you so much for helping. Uh, yeah, okay, so. Um, symbols, the symbols of spirit. Um, I, in, in the book, I take symbolic rationality to be more important for deeply forgetful individuals than linear rationality. Linear rationality is means ends rationality. We have to have the capacity uh, to make plans and perhaps operationalize them. We can be functional agents in that sense. But I don't think linear rationality uh, matters much ethically at all. I think it's the symbols that count. Thomas Carlyle, um, it is through symbols that man consciously or unconsciously lives, works, and has his being. And then Augustine, symbols are powerful because they are the visible signs of invisible realities. So I'll just take an example of Janet Keck, whose uh, son David uh, uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, Janet was the wife of Leander Keck, who was a New Testament exegete at Yale Divinity School for many years and a very, very famous one at that. She succumbed to probable Alzheimer's disease and people around the Divinity School and around Prospect Street uh, helped her around, but she got really quite, quite, uh, quite detached and incapable of much communication. But when they took her into the symbolically rich context of the Yale Chapel for a, um, for, for a service, she would just light up. She would chime in with those deeply learned hymns. She would chime in with those prayers that she identified over the course of her lifetime. Um, and she just, she became bright emotionally. And it was remarkable. In fact, after these services, she could have brief conversations that would fade but it was terribly meaningful because it meant that somehow or another, underneath all of that loss, um, she was still, she was still there. So again, it was rationality as a source of self-identity that she retained. Uh, who we are matters more than how we proceed. And of course, pastoral care, and many of you are interested in pastoral care, is largely based on symbols. I could give you many examples of a, for example, an old gentleman in, in Cleveland who was Catholic and he, even to the very end of his life, he grasped that rosary bead because how, how he understood that his identity was uh, linked with that symbolically. And he would occasionally surprise everybody and speak a few lines from the Lord's Prayer. So the title of this book, actually the cover itself is somewhat symbolic. I had nothing to do with the design. They did it at Johns Hopkins Press, they had a good artist. Um, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, How Caregivers Can Meet the Challenges of Alzheimer's Disease. Um, I'm not sure you'll have to look at this and interpret, your, interpret it yourself, but for me, it suggests that the, the continuing self-identity underneath deep forgetfulness is there. It's opaque. You know, these are cotton blossoms and so forth. It's opaque, it's faded somewhat, but it's still there and it's our job as caregivers to notice. That's a term that Larry Dossi uh, likes a lot and he endorsed the book, to notice this continuing self-identity, even though it may be a little bit in the distance, a little bit opaque and a little bit sporadic. This is Joe Foley to whom the book is dedicated. Uh, Joe was the only neurologist uh, in the 20th century. He was the president both of the American Neurological Society and the American uh, Society for Neurosciences. Uh, he was a medic at uh, Normandy at Utah Beach and I won't go into it, but he wrote a whole book about it. He was a great mentor to me. And we would travel around Ohio to various nursing homes. Um, we went to a place in Chardon, Ohio, uh, which is up in the northeast uh, corner of the state, a place called Heather Hill. And uh, we went into the special care unit for people with probable Alzheimer's disease. I always say probable because it really is not as clear as you think. At any rate, um, 
we read the bio sketch of a fellow named Jim that was on the wall um, of his of his uh, room, and we knew that he had a couple of a couple of sons. And so Joe and I went out into the uh, into the larger room where people were ambulating, and I asked the nurse, uh, "Can you point out uh, Jim?" And she did that. And I took Jim by the arm and we sat down at a table and I asked him a question wrongly. I said, Jim, how are your sons? Now the end of this is completely devoted to communication techniques. And you never ask an open-ended question like that because it puts people who are deeply forgetful uh, in on the defensive, their amygdala turns on. They have to now go back and retrieve language that may be very difficult for them uh, to touch on. So uh, you always want to say, um, and, and that's what I did. I corrected myself. I said, Jim, how are your sons? How's Luke? And he just lit up and he was really quite bright. He didn't respond verbally, but he was quite bright. And I could see that he knew a little bit about what I was talking of. And then I said, how's Zach, his other son? And then he also lit up. And it just seemed like if, you know, if warmth and love were electric, the place would have been on fire. So you, you, you never ask someone, do you, what would you like for breakfast? You always say, what would you like, omelets or post toasties, for example. You give them choice. You use language in such a way as to cue people uh, into the conversation. And, um, and so uh, then uh, Jim had this very, very nice, it was, it was the edges were smooth, the ends, the ends were sanded around. It was a white twig, and he put it in my hands, and then he smiled. And it was a beautiful, beautiful smile. And um, I couldn't believe how, how radiant he was when he gave that to me. And I asked the nurse, so what's the story with Jim and this twig? And uh, she said, well, he grew up on a farm not far from here. And he loved his father very much. And like a lot of people who were deeply forgetful, he had gone back in time to that point where he felt attachment, uh, at, that is to say tender loving care, his father loved him very much, and his dad gave him a chore every morning, which was to bring kindling in for the fireplace. So that white twig was a symbol of the love that he had experienced earlier in his life. And then there was, a, there was an old rag doll on the floor, and he picked it up, and he brought it into the corner where a woman was whimpering, uh, and he put it on her lap, and she stopped crying. And then I asked the nurse, so what's the story with that, that rag doll? And she said, well... Um, that's her rag doll. So somehow, even though Jim was um, struggling cognitively, he still had a certain amount of emotional intelligence. And so that's what I mean, you know, the, the twig, the doll, things that people identify with symbolically, even though um, their linear rationality may be compromised. And there are so many things to do, which I won't go into because it would take too long. But Creativity is, is, is always, you know, quite brilliant in some people with uh, deep forgetfulness, symbolic rationality, emotion, relationality, including dogs. We'll talk a little bit about dogs in a minute. Mirth, somatics, music and rhythm, you're, you're all aware of music and memory, beauty, smell, taste, spirituality, largely through symbolism, touch, consciousness, continuity of self-identity. So this is a picture by Willem de Kooning, who was an abstract expressionist, good friend of Larry Rivers, and he captured the anxiety of modernity that uh, Austin uh, really wrote about great in his, in his poetic masterpiece, The Age of Anxiety. Um, and this is the 19, early 1950s. De Kooning was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, at actually at Cornell uh, Memory Disorders Center. And uh, for 14 years, uh, he lived mostly in a loft in Greenwich Village. Uh, and he had one assistant who was with him. Uh, his behavior wasn't, wasn't bad. He, he still had a sense of who he was symbolically. He would dip that brush into the acrylic paint and he would walk up to, a, to, 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 a, to an easel. And he did a lot of really interesting stuff. Now, uh, the critics, uh, there was a posthumous exhibit the critics panned him. They said, well, this makes a mockery of, of uh, de Kooning. He was gone. He was a shell. He was empty. He was a husk. But actually, one critic whom I liked said, wait a minute, um, let's give him some credit. He still knew he was an artist. And he painted 
for 13 and a half years out of 14 years with progressive dementia. And I don't want to attribute anything to this kind of work. I don't, I don't want to say it's the equal of Georgia O'Keeffe, but it's a much brighter, um, I don't know, more, um, more elevating image, in my view, than, than some of his darker images. Um, this is, a, again, I'm talking really about the, what, what we can do with people, that they're still there and how we can connect with that. I gave a talk at the, at the uh, uh, Time Center in New York in, in 2013 uh, and uh, talked about uh, deep forgetfulness and talked about continuity of self-identity and why that was so important to ethics and how noticing is so key. Um, and uh, Olivia Havelzell had written a book called 10,000 Joys and 10,000 10, Sorrows, a very nice balanced perspective about the challenges, but also the joys of being a caregiver. And so um, I, I got home and, and she wrote me, uh, she wrote me an email and she said in that late stage when words are gone, except for those very occasional moments, she, now she's talking about her mother, who was a physicist and mathematician, looked at me intently and said forcefully, God, physics, and the cosmos. So you got to be open to surprises. And I define hope in the book as being open to surprises. And of course, there's a lot of work being done now on how music can evoke autobiographical memories. If you go to musicandmemory.org, which we don't have time to do, you'll see many cases of individuals who really are not communicative at all. But when you utilize personalized music, um, uh, uh, this is Dan Cohen's work. He's a wonderful clinical social worker who started the music and memory movement. And uh, one of his movies, Alive Inside, uh, got the uh, award for documentary at Sundance a, a number of years ago. Uh, amazing guy, he lives right here on Long Island. Um, so um, after being stimulated by familiar music, people who have otherwise been mute and distanced, will begin to get somatic, they'll begin to in, in, in engage a bit, they may be uh, able to sing a verse, and then afterwards, at least a certain percentage of them, will actually have brief conversations. Now that ends, and of course someone can say, well, it was really meaningless because it was just so transitory. But to the caregivers, it's a beautiful thing because what they see is that their work is not in vain, they're not caring for someone who is dead, gone, a husk, a shell, et cetera, all the negative metaphors, which are, by the way, invited by the word dementia, which is a purely negative term, a decline from a former mental state. And it distracts us from noticing what's still there. That's why deeply forgetful is a much better term of continuity and inclusion. Um, so music is very powerful and, there, and, and the studies going on are interesting. Uh, Aaron Copeland, spent the last five or six years of his life in Peekskill, New York, up along the Hudson River. And he had pretty severe, deep forgetfulness, shall we say. And musicians would come and visit him. They'd speak with him, hoping that he would respond. He usually didn't. But interestingly enough, occasionally he would just rise up sporadically to his piano, and he would play the six notes that form the two chords that are the basic structure of Appalachian Spring. I'd actually met Aaron Copeland as a high school kid. My brother and I invited him up to New Hampshire and he actually came, a uh, wonderful guy. Uh, I won't say, and if, if you have time, um, there is a great YouTube uh, uh, with Leonard Slatkin. There's a, there's a good talk right now about uh, dignity and the- <laughs> Okay. Uh, Anyway, Slatkin conducts Appalachian Spring in, with the Detroit Symphony. And uh, for the first thing he does is he turns, he turns to the audience, the audience and he explains how many people were going up to Peace Guild to visit uh, Copeland. And, then he, and, 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 and he tells us that Copeland would go up to the piano and play those notes. And then he says, so what was Aaron Copeland trying to say? Was he trying to say, I'm still here? Was he trying to say, I'm being verbatim here, here um, this is what I want to be remembered for. And then he turned around and he conducted a beautiful version of Appalachian Spring. Dogs, 
uh, in Scotland, I, I, I worked with uh, the Alzheimer's Association in Scotland when, when the idea of the Alzheimer dog movement first began, and then I was in Australia. Uh, this is Dogs for Dementia, which is an Australian website. Um, um, dogs, guide dogs, uh, service dogs for people who are deeply forgetful has gotten a lot of play around the world. It's not so much in the United States, there should be a lot more. Um, but you know, this is, allows for tactile interactions, relational interactions. Dogs really don't care if you're deeply forgetful or not. I was doing a talk in Brooklyn Heights a few years back uh, about the dog movement, just entirely about the dog movement. And this wonderful woman, Meryl Berdugo, uh, emailed me and she said, Bringing Lola to see Alzheimer's patients has made a tremendous difference in helping me open up the line of communication. Taking Marvin, who is 91 and lives at home with his wife, he, ha he has advanced AD. He has a full-time aide and sleeps in his own room while his wife has the master bedroom. Marvin had walked into her bedroom and fell asleep in the bed since the morning. The aide and his wife couldn't get him up. I walked in the room with Lola put her paws on him and said, Marvin, get up, look who came to visit. Marvin popped up, excited to see Lola. I was able to lure him out of bed and into the family room where his wife was. He couldn't contain his excitement. His wife and the aide couldn't believe it. Lola brought back his memory of his dog, Sparky. We had a big conference in Sydney on the dog movement. This is now about eight years ago. And uh, at one point in the afternoon, we had about 40 or 50 uh, people who were quite deeply forgetful, but with their dogs, they're, you know, me medium size to small Labradors, well-trained, you know, safe and loving and all of that. Uh, and they all had uh, uh, um, Alzheimer's vests on. And we went down the, um, the main drag of Sydney, past the Sydney hospital, and a cab driver uh, pulled over and he looked at me and he said, what's this? Dogs are for blind people. That's what we think, but actually uh, that's pretty narrow thinking. Even positive psychology. Um, I remember uh, the opportunity I had with Arthur Schwartz to introduce Sir John Templeton to Marty Seligman in 1998 at the Marriott Hotel in Philadelphia because Seligman wanted to get away from um, uh, learned helplessness in dogs and Sir John wanted a great scientist who could help with his laws of life about gratitude and kindness and forgiveness and all these things. And they melded beautifully together. And this whole movement has been outstanding. But now there's actually a really great book, which I endorsed, Positive Psychology Approaches to Dementia. I'm not going to go into it in depth, but it's pretty powerful. You think about, for example, in positive psychology, hope and love. I call hope in this context being open to surprises and noticing them. Oh, being open to surprises and noticing them. Isn't that a good definition? That's my definition. And love, uh, which I, I take my definition from Harry Stack Sullivan, a great psychiatrist at the University of Chicago, um, when the happiness and security of another is as real or sometimes more real to you than your own, you love that person. And if you think about it, the book actually has a phenomenology of the manifestations of love in caregiving. Caregiving is actually a manifestation itself of love, but compassion, helping, forgiveness. There are lots of moments of forgiveness, gratitude, respect, celebration, listening attentively, loyalty, creativity, care, frontation, uh, a term that uh, M. Scott Peck and I coined together and wrote an article about. Um, but love, love and hope. So those are positive things. And we're looking at how we can bring the most into the lives of people who are deeply forgetful. Now, I'm just going to uh, go, go on this for a few minutes, which, which uh, um, I hope will not um, uh, make anyone feel that I'm being too simple minded. But, you know, what is mind? And, and how should we think about people who are deeply forgetful? Henri Bergson, one of my favorite philosophers, wrote a great book called Matter and Memory, an essay on the relation of body and spirit, 1896. He was kind of like Sir John Eccles, you know, mind before matter, uh, which is sort of the metaphysics of most of the great traditions. 
And you can include Tolkien, Emerson's Oversoul, T.S. Eliot, the Buddha, Gandhi, Jung, Ken Wilber, Aldous Huxley, uh, certainly Larry Dossi, uh, uh, Nasser, Campbell, Plato, St. Paul, Eccles, the people who said namaste in Mount Vernon. In other words, they think that there's a mystery to the mind and we shouldn't write it off. So there's a term being thrown around now, uh, which I was using in, in 1994, 95, a long, long time ago, uh, paradoxical lucidity, a potential paradigm shift. This is the name of an actual article um, that appeared in Alzheimer's and dementias. Um, it, uh, you know, how, can we, how can we take those moments, so surprising moments, of lucidity, which are sometimes so, so astonishing, you know, God, physics, and the universe. How can we take those and learn from them? So the NIA is actually um, uh, uh, supporting several very good studies on what's going on in the brain when people do have these moments. I won't, don't want to get into the uh, methods of it. Uh, they do use PET scans and such things, but um, this is unexpected cognitive lucidity and communication in patients with severe dementias, especially around the time of death, but it's really not. Uh, it, it can be uh, in, in, on a long continuum um, that have been reported and observed uh, anecdotally. Um, here we review what is known about this phenomenon, related phenomena that provide insight into potential mechanisms, ethical implications, notice that, ethical implications, and methodological considerations for systematic investigation. So, you know, Nobody doubts that a lot of caregivers, in fact, the majority of caregivers in various studies will um, report that they were surprised that somehow, uh, you know, on a certain day, somebody really kind of was insightful. The guy who was coming into an art therapy class in the mornings and he would scribble the same lines on a piece of paper with a, with a pencil, but, but he, he, it was interesting. There was always this one line down the middle and people would ask him, so Jack, what's this? He couldn't respond, but one morning they asked him and he said, it's a map so my daughter can find her way to my house. So in other words, there's always the possibility that underneath an action like this, there is more purpose than, 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 behold, than, we, than we can behold. Uh, so you have the same facts, you have different metaphysics. You can view this as a materialistic issue. Some small fragment of the brain is somehow still intact and firing off, or you can view it more like Sir John Eccles would view it. Um, and again, this is the announcement of the uh, request for proposals from the NIA. Uh, they've actually had two funding announcements and they think that this is something that we can really study. But you know what? It wouldn't ever have even come up if people uh, hadn't noticed it, if caregivers hadn't noticed it. So now this gets a little over the top. Simon, why Berkovich was at George Washington University. Yes, I met him. And he speculated a model of the brain as the local computer term, terminal connected to some larger informational system. We'll get back to that. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just trying to open minds. T.F. Bradley, uh, UCSD, 2008, writing uh, in, uh, Proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences. Visual memory is so massive is to quote, pose a challenge to neural models of memory storage and retrieval, which must be able to account for such a large and detailed storage capacity. St. Augustine in, 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 the, in, in, in his uh, wonderful confessions spends a lot of time talking about memory, thinks it's a miracle. You can just in, the, in, a, in, the, in a moment, in a millisecond, you can bring up the whole universe in your imagination. So what's going on there? Can that be explained physiologically? Well, the classical view is no, it can't. And Bradley actually thinks there's something to that. Uh, Donald Forsdyke at Queen's University in Ontario, studies show intelligent adults with fine memory, but no more than 5% of normal brain tissue having been cured of hydrocephaly as children. Give us three models. The standard model, that long-term memory is held in the brain in some chemical or physical form. The long-term memory held in the brain uh, uh, is in some minute subatomic form as of yet unknown. 
And another one, information relating to long-term memory is held outside the brain. Um, so actually he suggests it's kind of like the computers on your desk. The computer on your desk can hold a certain amount of memory, but a lot of your memory is in the cloud. And what the brain does is access memory from the cloud. Well, who knows? No one's trying to say anything for sure, but it's interesting. The title of this article for reasons that are kind of fascinating, Wittgenstein's certainty is uncertain. Brain scans have cured hydrocephalics, hydrocephalics challenge, cherished assumptions. <clears throat> There's a wonderful book that came out two years ago called Beyond Physicalism uh, Toward Reconciliation of Science and Spirituality, um, uh, which includes a lot of great writers. And there are two wonderful, wonderful chapters there on paradoxical lucidity. And they do not simply accept a physiological explanation. So look, you know, if we think about people who are deeply forgetful in purely material terms, then and and think of them purely in terms of dementia, again, a decline from a former mental state. And we put that in the context of what I called in 1995 hypercognitive values. This is why I don't like Locke and Kant and a lot of people in the West. I I I uh, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm driven to Tirgastrasse 4 in Berlin, 1939 to 41, when 70,000 people were taking out, taking out of asylums. About half of them, Beno Mueller Hill, an historian of this period, comments, were probably individuals with cognitive developmental disabilities. And about half of them had uh, dementias related to uh, old age. And so uh, these were life unworthy of life. They were useless eaters, along with Jews, gypsies, gays, etc. And of course, philosophies of rationalist personhood made this worse, uh, coupled with utilitarian, uh, utilitarian eugenics, um, some of which came right from my neighbor here at Cold Spring Harbor. And, um, um, and so the hypothermia experiments, the notorious hypothermia experiments were started in this vulnerable population. These were people who were left to freeze in the snow, freeze on ice, uh, uh, then they would be brought back into the asylum and thawed out at different temperatures and different gradients. And um, even the, uh, the German people revolted against T4, Tiergestrasse 4, um, uh, and it was stopped after about a year and a half. But some of the same people who were running it went right to the death camps of Auschwitz and Dachau. Um, so that is something that can happen. Uh, and that's why we need to notice uh, the value and the dignity of these individuals. While uh, Dr. Leo Alexander, these are some of the negative meta metaphors. Uh, by the way, I, I love Martin Luther King's idea of the beloved community. And one of the things King wrote about a lot was that to open up the beloved community, the truly inclusive community toward all humanity, we need a language for that belovedness. And, and uh, one of his great uh, students and friends, uh, Pastor Otis Moss, who was my um, uh, mentor for many years and still is, he said that the language of deep forgetfulness opens up the beloved community to people who are otherwise excluded. Um, Gulliver's Travels, some of the things that the King of the Lugnagians tells Gull Gulliver about the the, um, uh, the immortals, the Strulbrugs, every once in a while someone is born, they'll live forever, and they're hated because uh, they forget the common appellation of things. They can no longer converse because they forget what was said immediately prior. And he says to Gulliver, take a few Strulbrugs home to your own country to arm your people against the fear of death. Actually, Gulliver uh, 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 was, his responses to this are very interesting. Swift was an advocate for the deeply forgetful, and I'm not going to go into that because I don't have time. Um, but we still have, you know, this attitude in the injustice of leftovers. Um, you know, uh, there's so many people who were diagnosed with dementia, about half of which is probably caused by Alzheimer's. <clears throat> uh, it's at least twice as high in African Americans as in Caucasians. Um, but what do we do? You know, we um, we have people spend down into relative poverty to get uh, pub public entitlement for nursing home support. In contrast to say Canada, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. You can go to Canada and every province in Canada has a good Samaritan organization. 
I visited most of them, you know, and they have free long term care, uh, free residential care, free hospice. It's great. They may not spend as much money trying to save every human being from death, from the inevitability of death in the last six months of life, but they do a lot, uh, something very beautiful in addition to that. So in, in the US, you know, we, we, we give scraps, we give leftovers to caregivers. And I think that's a real, a real problem. This, by the way, is Leo Alexander's wonderful article in the New England Journal of Medicine, Medical Science Under Dictatorship. And what he says politically uh, is that it's mid-level voluntary associations that make the difference for these vulnerable populations. You got the state up here, you got the public down here, but you need these mid-level organizations. So then you have the Alzheimer's Association, the Spina Bifida Association, ARC, uh, and so forth, et cetera, uh, the ALS Association. You need committed voluntary associations where people will stand up and advocate for these vulnerable populations. And that, uh, Leo Alexander, uh, argued, and he, by the way, is partly responsible for the writing of the Nuremberg Code. There was another uh, fine physician also involved. Um, and by the way, Joe Foley was a student of Leo Alexander, who was a great neurologist at Tufts. Um, but at any rate, you know, these are things we really need to think about. Um, uh, I want to say one thing that, you know, disability and bioethics, there's a tension there. Um, uh, Eva Kate, um, my colleague here who does ethics of care with her daughter, uh, uh, Sesha, who is uh, uh, quite severely cognitively uh, disabled. But, uh, you know, there have been many cases where people who are deeply forgetful have also um, felt um, that they have not been respected and their caregivers have felt that uh, the decisions being made have not been fully respectful either. I'm not gonna go into this, it's just too much. Is there such a thing as prevention? I do talk about that in the book. You know, you, you read serious articles now about the Mediterranean diet, greens and fruits, walking, cognitive stimulation, social and intellectual engagement, sleep, meditation to de-stress. This is something that Harold Koenig has uh, written about with Dharma S. Khalsa, who runs a national organization called Alzheimer's Prevention. Music and memory, a good multivitamin, you know, really healthy aging is, is part of the answer. Who is destined for Alzheimer's disease? Well, um, there are 50 million people worldwide now. And these are just rough numbers. There will be much more in the future. Margaret Locke at McGill writes about the Alzheimer's conundrum, the entanglements of dementia and aging. She points out that Dr. Alois Alzheimer in, in 1907 didn't think that he discovered a disease in the famous case of Augusta D, who was, I think, 57 years old. He did notice on autopsy that she had these um, so-called plaques in her brain, uh, but he thought this was just an aspect of normal brain aging. He thought that everybody would have these if they just lived long enough. And there's a certain amount of truth to that argument, uh, so I won't get into it, uh, but um, uh, this is something that uh, it, it's very difficult to, dis, to, just, to, to determine that there's them and us, because when we may all be headed down this, this path. Uh, Peter Whitehouse uh, has spoken a lot about public health uh, and Alzheimer's diet, lead removal, education. The Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention uh, talks about modifiable risk factors, which include head injuries in midlife, excessive alcohol consumption, air pollution in later life, sedentary lifestyle, and many other things. And JAMA issued its social determinants of dementia. Uh, it talked about associations with income, education, housing, employment, nutrition, and neighborhoods. Who knows, maybe lead is a factor and maybe certain people who live in uh, highly lead polluted neighborhoods are at greater risk. That might explain something about the African-American community. Volunteering could be helpful. I'm not gonna go into this, but uh, volunteering uh, can make a big difference, can get people off the couch, you can get them involved in pro-social activities. This was a study we did with United Healthcare uh, uh, with uh, about 5,000 adult Americans pointing out that uh, about 41% uh, of them volunteered in 2009, this was done in early 2010, and this is what they're saying. Uh, it, it improved them in many, many ways, certainly was de-stressing. 
and most neurologists now will acknowledge, they didn't 20 years ago, that stress is a factor, one of probably seven or eight factors contributing to hippocampal atrophy and to Alzheimer's disease. So let's think about that. Now, uh, okay, so new meaning, breathe deep and notice. This is Rockwell's great iconic image of the golden rule in its positive form. <clears throat> um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Certainly gets the mind uh, off the uh, destructive emotional pathways of rumination, bitterness, and hostility that are so much connected with stress. Uh, purpose and kindness. This is, again, positive psychology. This came out of uh, Rush Presbyterian in Chicago. Older adults who rated high quartile on a purpose of life scale had 30% lower rate of cognitive decline than the low quartile. It's pretty interesting. Um, quoting Shakespeare and Picasso, nobody's quite sure who, who, to, who, to, who, to, who to cite on this. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. This is Skyatri Devi, I think the most progressive Alzheimer's expert in the greater New York area. The spectrum of hope an optimistic approach. She doesn't think there's any clear biological determinism here. She thinks we're overestimating stage theories, genetic determinism. She makes a lot out of neuroplasticity and she thinks that how you interact with deeply forgetful people actually affects the course of the underlying dementia itself. Think about that. Okay, so how we interact is very important. Um, I'm not gonna talk about pharma, it's too much. Although these things have not worked out, uh, I won't talk about Biogen and so forth. Maybe somebody someday will fulfill this uh, uh, 1975 statement from the uh, Alzheimer's Association National Meeting in Chicago, where everybody was very high on the idea that with cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, we would in fact put a halt to this problem. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. And uh, you know, aging and Alzheimer's, where do they um, where do they separate? Where are they the same thing? I really don't know. Um, ethical quandaries, I'm going to wind up in just a minute. Um, you know, I, and I can't talk about these because I'm really wanting to focus on the spirituality and the idea of mind and body, but enrollment in research, diagnostic disclosure, autonomy, restrictions on driving, autosomal genetic testing, advanced planning, intimacy in nursing homes. I will say something about pain nutrition. Um, most people, uh, most older uh, adults who are just queried in, in, the, in the waiting rooms of physicians' offices, 95% say if they were to have dementia, um, they would not want anything done to keep them going. They don't necessarily say, I want preemptive assisted suicide, but they don't want anything done purposefully to extend their lives. And that means, you know, insulin for diabetes. It means they don't want that contraption on their back for their car chronic ca cardiac problems. Um, it means a lot of things. They just want to basically go in peace. It means they don't want a feeding peg or anything in every tube, natural and unnatural, or any tube, natural or unnatural. And by the way, this is a mortality curve. Uh, the, uh, the dotted line is people who are on a feeding peg. Uh, and you see that more of them are dying than the ones who are getting assisted oral feeding. That's the dashed line. That's what I did with my grandmother post in a nursing home when she was dying, what they called senile dementia then because no one much used the word Alzheimer's disease. And there was a lot that went on between us, even though she couldn't communicate with me. Although surprisingly, sometimes she would say, Stevie, that tastes good. We would do applesauce bran and such things. And there was a kind of ritualistic connection. And sometimes I would look into her eyes and I could see her brighten up. It was just like grandma post who knew me as a kid when I pop by her apartment and there was love there. Okay, I won't go into this because uh, it's too much, but uh, prevalence of pain, I think it's really great that we now have the pain AD scale for assessing pain. Anybody can use it. I've used it myself in, in a number of nursing home situations and even taught, part, taught it to nurses aides, but there are ways that you can pick this up. And it's not the case that if someone has dementia and they're in pain and they're moaning, that you can say, well, that's just the dementia. No, probably not. It's probably, um, you know, um, uh, pain from, uh, you know, spinal difficulties or whatever, a thousand different causes, but we have to take their pain very seriously. Last comment, preemptive assisted suicide. So um, 
When I was in Chicago, I knew two great psychiatrists and they were both mentors of mine. Uh, one was named Chase and one was named Bruno. I will say nothing more. Uh, Chase had a beautiful family. They loved him, he loved them. He was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's. Um, and incidentally, around at that time, um, around, around the hospital, uh, people said, oh, Chase, he's demented. And they used demented in, 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 in essentially a derisive way. That's why I don't like the term. Ever since I heard it used about Chase, who was the most gentle guy in the world, in that fashion, I thought, okay, we need something better. Um, so uh, Chase lived about 10 more years. Uh, he spent the last few years of his life in a, in a nursing home, but he had a good quality of life. Bruno had no family at all. About a quarter of people with Alzheimer's disease are, are now referred to as live alones. I don't like the language, but they have no families. So Bruno had no family. And he, he took 40 secondals and put a plastic bag over his head. And he showed up in the uh, Chicago uh, uh, Tribune the next day. Now, what about this? You know, people from America, they, they, they go to Dignitas in, in Switzerland. I, I tell the story in the book about a fellow who was a street clown in San Francisco. He had no uh, family relationships. And, and, um, and he, he's, he's actually in a research project and he's declining. And while he's still got his capacities, he gets an airplane ticket and he goes off to Switzerland and he is euthanized. Uh, some people go to Quebec, some go to the Netherlands where they don't have these six months month rules. We have assisted suicide in the US, but you've got to have two doctors independently saying that you're going to die probably within about six months, a little flexibility there. And you still got to be capacitated someone with progressive dementia, by the time they're within six months or a year of death, they probably long since lost their linear rationality and their agency. So that may be something that we need to revisit. I don't know. I'm not an advocate for this. But in the book, I do talk about several cases I was involved in, not as a facilitator, but families who had gone to a neurologist who didn't want to have anything to do with this. Fair enough. Hippocratic oath. Um, and, uh, um, you know, um, uh, this was something that grandma really wanted. She thought this had dignity about it. And, uh, and I knew a lot of these families and they would ask me, would I just be there to, just to say a prayer with them and, and not to condone it, but just to be there. And, and, and I did that on several occasions. And, you know, it wasn't horrific. Uh, you know, the fireplace would be on, the, the um, um, you know, they'd be playing some, some Bach, um, and uh, there'd be no grandchildren uh, around. I always insisted on that with them. I said, I don't want any grandchildren in the, anywhere near this because as Thomas Aquinas said in his third and most important argument against suicide, it has a certain epidemic quality. It creates a legacy. And I don't want that legacy ever affecting anyone who's younger because I don't like the idea of anybody who's younger, say jumping off the roof of the library at NYU, which was happening 15 years ago. So, um, you know, it was pretty peaceful. And eventually, after goodbyes, uh, grandma would take that chocolate milkshake full of sequinols, swallow it, and then, you know, fade off into, into sleep. And, and that was it. And uh, I, didn't, I, I, I never wanted to judge anybody for that. You know, there's a passage I like, um, judge not lest ye be judged. Again, I know I've, I've never written in support of this. And in the book, they actually point out for really good reasons to be very cautious about it, especially in America. We don't have an underlying support system for people who do want to go on to life. And so in that sense, uh, assisted suicide could easily become um, the only option. I won't talk about Janet Atkins, who was Kevorkian's first subject. Uh, I won't talk about how uh, she was uh, gathered together with her three sons and uh, a member of the Hemlock Society, and she thought this was very rational. Uh, so again, not to talk about this in depth, but we did an informal survey 20 years ago of caregivers around the country with the Alzheimer's Association, and about a third of them were totally against assisted suicide, about a third of them were for it, and about a third of them were on the fence. This is an article I wrote with the UCSF folks on um, Mr. Vine, who's the one who was the street clown in uh, San Francisco. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it. This is an earlier book, um, The Moral Challenge of Alzheimer's Disease that 
uh, is now much superseded by, by this. And this is the Good Samaritan win window of Chagall, always my favorite artist. Um, and this is in Peconico Hills at the Union Church. It's the whole back of the church. And uh, you'll see again, it's symbols from every spiritual tradition. He was a deeply spiritual man. And uh, if you read his uh, book, um, uh, uh, My Life, which he wrote after he left St. Petersburg and was in, in Moscow, he talks about his experience in an alley when he was in St. Petersburg. He never painted ever in his life, but he was sketching things in the streets. He's on, a, on an old mattress in an alley and he sees a tremendous blue light descend from above and take the shape of an angel. And then it lifted up and he was astonished. And the next day he went out and he did his first actual painting called The Apparition. And when he died in the outskirts of Paris, he was in his studio and he was writing, he was, he was painting a blue angel. I just throw that in, think about it. Thanks. Stephen, an amazing talk once again. Thank you so much. We've got about five minutes or so uh, for questions. I would encourage viewers to unmute yourself and ask Stephen if you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, or slap. <laughs> Certainly, Sayed, Sayed um, you have your hand up here. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you. My uh, beautiful teacher, Professor Post. My question is about origin. The origin of the person from birth, before birth, and then how can I look at Silk Road and the origin of both East and West? Well, Syed, what, you can call me. Call me on my cell phone later in the day, and I'll give you some thoughts about the Eastern and Western distinctions between the origins of the deepest aspect of the person, okay? So give me a call later. All right, thank else. you. Sure, it's good to see you. Who else? I see Jeff Trilling, my, my colleague here. And I'm trying to figure out how to unmute this without holding down my hold bar. Yes, I'll tell you, Stephen, I'm, I'm familiar with your philosophy about the deeply forgetful. And, and I, I particularly, uh, in today's lecture, um, I was uh, struck by your saying that there's a mystery to the mind that we should not disregard. And uh, it really, uh, really spoke to me and uh, the number of the examples of uh, uh, other, other great authors and, and philosophers. Uh, your book gives one pause. And, and I, I, I uh, it's kind of overwhelming, but uh, you instruct us to kind of stand sideways to our traditional viewpoint of dementia and to take another point of view. And I think that's a quick summary of what I've taken home from today. Uh, I don't have as many questions as I, there's so much to digest yet. And uh, I'll get back to you with the questions eventually. But you know, I quote you, Jeff, you're in the book. Yeah, I, I, I know you do. And uh, my colleague, Jeff Trilling, who was the head of family medicine here at Stony Brook for a long time, um, he was in charge of a large unit for deeply forgetful people at our nearby Long Island Veterans Nursing Home. He once told me about the time he brought a Native American Lakota flute to work there one day, then sat quietly and played for a while. Gradually, nearly all of the 40 or 50 people in the unit rose up and walked toward the sound. And he led them out into the lovely garden pasture adjacent to the union. That's behind that unit. 
Quote, none of them look perplexed or anxious, said Jeff. And I wonder to myself if they are closer to the great spirit than I have ever been. That was in my more eloquent years, I was able to. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that Rob Daroff? Are you Bob Daroff's son? How, uh, so nice to see you. You knew Joe Foley, right? Yeah, I mean, you got to unmute. I, I have to, to, to so I, to, what do you think, how, how would Joe feel about this? The book is dedicated to us, to him. It talks about um, uh, his, um, his life a little bit. It has that beautiful photograph, which I got permission to use from neurology. My mom is actually on the call as well. And she, for Father's Day, gave each of her sons, I have two brothers, uh, a copy of your book uh, to help us um, kind of understand my father's uh, deeply forgetful state. So, so with much much appreciation, it's a real real treat to be here and to hear hear from you. Thank you. This is a picture of Joe Foley. Joe Foley, just a you know one second. So the guy is at Utah Beach. He's the medic, Navy medic. He gets off in the second line. The guy in front of him is driving a tractor. He's immediately decapitated. Joe jumps in the tractor. He drives it to a seawall. Now he's got two walls to his clinic, the seawall and the tractor. He starts bringing people in from nearby Omaha Beach, flooded with patients. So they bring someone in on a stretcher who's got a huge gash in his carotid artery. And the guy looks at Joe and recognizes him immediately as one of his former schoolmates from Harvard Medical School. And he says, Joe, am I going to make it? And Joe says, I'm afraid not. And the guy looks at him and he says, here I am on a beach when I really need a doctor and I run into a quack like you. And those are his words. <laughs> Believable. Joe, incredible. Jody, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm so glad to be here. I know Stephen from Stony Brook. I've been involved with the Children's Advisory Council over there after caring for um, my daughter with special needs, which taught me um, what articulated so well, Stephen, to notice. Um, the job of a caregiver is to notice and to look around and see the symbols. And it just so happens that as you were coming out with this book, I knew it was coming and I was eagerly waiting for it. I was um, caring for my mom who had gotten a diagnosis a couple of years ago of stage four dementia. And it has been fascinating to watch her process um, and the things that you speak of, um, even the symbolism of the cover of this book. And it's funny that you mentioned that because last night as I was reading it, I thought, hmm, I wonder what was behind the cover. Um, partly because I noticed, because that's what I think the gift I have received is after being a caregiver, that it wasn't fully co colored. And my mom had said to me one day, and she's she's doing well, by the way, she's she's very well engaged uh, in the assisted living that she's in. And what a, I started my career, I don't know if you know this, Stephen, as an activities director in a nursing home. No, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, so who knew where life was gonna lead 20 some odd years later. But anyway, um, so it's been interesting to watch her respond, but, but one of the days she wasn't having such a good day and, and she said to me, um, yeah, no, today's off. And I said, well, well, what's going on? What's going on in your mind? And she said, I'm just a blank piece of paper. And, you know, I've learned to pivot quickly. And I said, well, now that you finally have a clean slate, what would you put on the paper? And she very quickly responded, which surprised me, because usually it's a long linger, like you said, open-ended questions. Yeah. And she said, well, my kids, of course. And I was shocked because she's been separated from a lot of her kids. And, you know, that's that's a different story. But nonetheless, you know, one of the things I've observed, and this is maybe just my hope, all of all of the memories are in there. Yeah. They just keep coming off of different shelves at different times in different folders. And sometimes the folders get mixed up. But I find myself on a journey of um, investigation and trying to trace the path. And usually if I will 
pay attention, I can find the memory and discover. And I have found myself, uh, one day she talked about, you know, I might have a brother or sister, which of course would be impossible at 73 in her age, but that's where her mind was. And my first thought was, well, you know, mom, that's a little off today. But then I went, wait a minute, which one of my siblings is she pregnant with right now in her mind? And I got to find out how she felt about being pregnant with one of my siblings, yeah. you know, 50 years ago. 50 years ago. So that I find like I'm on a treasure hunt and I'm finding a lot of treasure. Um, but the, the thing I had to do was clear the hurdle of getting out of the way. And I don't want to say too much more, but you know what? I have to tell you, Stephen, thank you for putting caregivers first in this. Um, again, it's so typical that it's sort of like the afterthought, but caregivers are the medicine. They are the treatment. They are the prescription. And the way we care and how we care matters. Um, so I just love that you honored that in this, in the way you presented this book. I'm only into the first three chapters, so um, I'm just grateful. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this. Thanks, Jody. And I always enjoy seeing you around the uh, hospital hallways over a cup of coffee. So come, let me know when you're by next time. I will. But yeah, you know, this is why, I, I mean, I, I, I could, I've presented all over the country for 25 years on the ethics of Alzheimer's, the moral challenges. But you know, this is a book that does that, but it's also dominantly more of a spiritual perspective. It's trying to say just what Jody is saying, you know, can we stop being derisive? Uh, to me, the word dementia is very similar to the word retard. Strictly a negative term. And we don't use the word retard anymore, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, dementia. And, you know, I talk with Joe about this, uh, Rob, occasionally, and he knew, he knew dementia was a necessary word for, word for the medical context, but he also thought that it was, a, it was somewhat humiliating. And you, and you hear it used even by politicians who will go unnamed, you know, who are saying that, well, their adversary is just demented in the most horrifying way. And so deeply forgetful is more of a continuum you know, we're all little, you know, I was out in the parking lot behind this beautiful, brutalist building, as Jeff knows it so well. And one day, I was really tired. And I didn't, I could not remember where I parked my car. But I actually had to ask a medical student. This is embarrassing. Do you know if I drove to work today? She cracked up. Because you know, we all have these moments and, 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 you know, it can be pseudo dementia where people get deeply forgetful because of depression or whatever. Uh, it can be anxiety. It can be, um, I mean, of course, when you're, when you're a child, you don't have memory, you have emotional memory. They talk about, you know, and, and, and that has to unfold, but uh, you know, the, we, we cannot evaluate hum the value of human life based on memory cognitive capacity, economic productivity. These are all gauche, utilitarian, Western concepts. And that's why when His Holiness came, I have His Holiness's letter to me right here on my wall, which Jeff sees all the time, you know, and, and he basically says, you know, you gotta, you gotta treat these people well because they have consciousness and there's no reason to think that they're less valuable than anybody on this call, just because they're more deeply forgetful. Okay, I said too much. Harold. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, thank you for a marvelous presentation. Just marvelous and, and such a Stephen. spiritual, such a spiritual way to do it. So uh, we thank you. Thank you for everyone here too, has, who have been listening and also those who have made comments to stimulate Stephen's responses. So. Thank you all, and we'll have to end.